I want to have a chat with you today about life after the PhD. Now hang on, wait a second. Some of you are struggling to finish the PhD, much less get your chapters done, everything lined up. Why, why think about this now? Listen, this is something you need to think about even before you start your PhD, ideally. But many of you going through your trajectories now don't even have full grasp of what all the options are with a few simple tweaks that you can take now that are gonna help you be on a fantastic career course and helping you live the life of your dreams when you get to the end of this marathon that you're on. I'm Professor David Stuckler, and I've worked with hundreds of students in my time as a professor at Harvard, Oxford, and now at University of Bocconi in Milan, where I'm a full professor. And life after the PhD is just something we don't talk enough about. Too often, it seems like a foregone conclusion. Well, of course, if you're capable, you would stay in the university. That's what I did, that's what you should do. But I really want to encourage you guys to stop, think for a second, diversify the voices that you're hearing to explore and at least know what those alternative roads are. If anything, this video is going to help prime you to think about what your ticket might be to a really exciting life that might not just be the conveyor belt that you're on at the moment. And this is also really important for a lot of people who I think sometimes get the false impression that if they don't continue down an academic path, they failed. And honestly, I think sometimes professors like myself are personally responsible for that because we did that ourselves. We think we need to advise other students to do that and, and nothing short of that is not good enough. I don't think that could be further from the truth. In fact, I think it's really dangerous when professors give you advice based on what they did. It's much easier to give you advice based on what did not work for them, then, uh, because that's likely not to work for you, then give you advice on what worked for them so it could work for you. There's just a lot of uh, dubious assumptions that go into that. So first thing I wanna do in this video is, is have you stop and think about your career path. And many of you uh, may never have really, really done this, getting drawn into the day-to-day -day rhythms of all the things you have to do to get to the end of the PhD, barely catching your breath. But I want you to stop and think uh, and use the approach that I use with my students, which is to reverse engineer what you want your life to look like and make sure that the path you're on is getting you to that life. One of the sources of dissatisfactions I see uh, among professors is they go in and they think if they do all the right things, they publish papers, uh, they get a permanent position, they're gonna have the life they want only to find, oh, hang on, wait a second, I can't afford uh, to send my kids to the private schools I wanna send them to. And then they start to feel incredibly frustrated by how their life is turning out. So I want you to first reverse engineer and think about what are the things that are important to you in your life after the PhD? Uh, for some of you, that might be freedom. Freedom, control of your time, freedom to ask the big questions. Uh, for some of you, it might be geography. Maybe you have a partner, uh, you need to be close to family, you have some specificities there. Many of you are really motivated by making a difference and doing work that you believe is meaningful. And yes, money needs to be part of this conversation. Uh, you do need to have a think about if financially the path you're going down is gonna get you where you want to go. I just see so many students, it's almost like they get in the car, they put their head down, they start driving, and when they get to where they're going, they get out of the car, they look around and think, hang on, wait a second, this isn't, this isn't what I thought things were gonna look like. And by then, it's sadly, it's often too late to re-engineer major changes because you guys are in formative stages and steps you take now have big implications and multiply into your future. So make sure at some point you do that discovery exercise in yourself and map out what is it you want your dream future to look like and make sure the steps you're taking now are pointing in a straight line to get you there. So what are some alternatives and I think really good alternatives outside the university. Well, sometimes you may not realize that a lot of the skills you're picking up, such as being able to execute on a daily basis, being disciplined, taking on big projects, these are really transferable, translatable skills that are in demand in a range of sectors, especially as well skills on writing. Those of you who are doing uh, quantitative analysis or qualitative analysis, really being able to go deep, those of you with specialized lab skills, uh, these are highly prized and sought after in many places, maybe places you have look or even had exposure to. One of the first places to look is, of course, in, in government positions. Uh, civil service jobs often do uh, highly prize and privilege uh, educated persons. And a PhD is often an essential requirement to break through some of the, to the upper echelons 
in those systems. The same goes for UN type positions or uh, getting to higher echelons in running NGOs. And this can really help you maximize making a difference. And so for many people, these are very attractive. They offer nice benefit packages. So I'll talk in a second about the kinds of strategies you might want to think about now about already getting your foot in the door if this is a path you want to explore. Uh, the second route uh, that you might want to consider is the private sector. And uh, if you're wanting to optimize on remuneration, this is by far the obvious choice. And especially consulting for many of you, because you have such specialized knowledge, can be very high in demand and will often pay two and a half to three times what you're likely to make in a university setting. Again, money is not everything and there's a lot of variation and finding a good fit with these will can still help you ensure that you're doing work that you love, you feel proud of and excited uh, to get out of bed in the morning for. And there's also, of course, a pure industry job working for a pharmaceutical company. You have lab skills or, or specialized knowledge that can work there. There's a whole range of options. And, and often, I don't think we do a good enough job sharing with our students uh, what these pathways look like and we don't have very much infrastructure at all to help them transition. So what I want you to do as you've now thought about how to what your dream life could look like, you know, there may be many dimensions to that story. I want you to just focus on two. And uh, the psychology of it is, is that people feel lost and confused when there are many complex dis dimensions to the decisions to optimize and they often make worse decisions. But 95% of the time they'll get it right if they just optimize on the top two dimensions. So at the very least, I want you to think what those two dimensions for you are, whether that's freedom or geography or money or making a difference or what, whatever that might be. And, and think about and start mapping out, just force yourself to take five, 10 minutes and consider what, what trajectories are are out there outside the university. And if you still find that you are drawn to the university and that's the life you want, fantastic. Um, it's not an easy life, but it can be richly, richly rewarding. That said, you might find it triggers some ideas about hybrid models. And I think I'm personally an example of this, that you can be, uh, you can fuse a compelling academic life where you publish and you make a difference and contribute to the frontiers of your field with consulting, with contributing to the private sector. And I find personally by working uh, with my research and working closely with NGOs, working with the NGN, with the UN, especially the World Health Organization in my case, this really helps me amplify the impact of my work. Sometimes it directly feeds back and contributes to, to my research by getting access to new data, new ideas, new connections. So I would encourage you to explore those hybrid models uh, that can really help you achieve even greater impact in your research and might help you in that process of discovering new ideas, uh, new data and resources to help your research paradigm thrive. If you are thinking about these models and thinking about the life after the PhD, it's important that you might want to take some steps now. A few simple tweaks can really help pave the way so that you don't finish your PhD and feel so excited and wait for those fireworks to go off and, and get done and just hear a deafening silence. I don't want that to happen to you. So if you take the right steps, these are things that are important. Just start building your networks inside your PhD. This might be taking internships applying uh, for summer positions, winter positions, short term, maybe unpaid, uh, it, just to get your foot in the door. And that's gonna help you explore alternative futures to see if you like them. So don't neglect the role of internships. Uh, that can be an incredibly important way so that you're gonna, if you are gonna go down that hard academic road, it'll give you more confidence to know that this is really right for you. There are also some really fantastic fellowships that I recommend to a lot of students that uh, involve science and policy inside government. And those can be some fantastic rotations to do if you get those options. They're often a highly competitive and sought after. I know, for example, in the UK, the Wellcome Trust offers several of these. I do encourage whatever field you're in to be right at the interface of science and policy. It's incredibly exciting, and it's gonna help you down the road if you do go down an academic path in terms of applying for grants and trying to persuade others about the critical importance of your work. Um, and I wanna point out um, one other thing that you can do that might be an easy tweak. And that can be using the publications from your PhD to leverage co-authors to get them engaged in the work, get more visibility to you. And this is a great way to already open up the door and build a relationship 
uh, that might help you in your academic path, but could very well pave the way to an exciting career path and jobs you might not have thought about before. I've had several students by co-authoring uh, with people in Google, for example, um, were able to then go on and carve out a niche and build up a relationship that opened the floodgates to job offers. That student uh, eventually didn't go down the Google path. It, it did open uh, his eyes to alternative futures that he eventually went down. So listen, let me know what you're thinking about life after the PhD. And if you are interested in exploring some of these transitions for yourself, uh, start early. And if you find yourself in between your end of the PhD and you're realizing, hey, I'm not so sure I want to go down an academic path, I'd encourage you to join my exclusive Facebook group, Fast Track Grad, which helps students do all the things they need to do to thrive, not just in the PhD, but also beyond, and tap some of our more detailed, valuable masterclasses on life after the PhD. And I'd encourage you to apply for a one-to-one -one chat with me where we can map out and help you uh, go through that discovery process of reverse engineering and working towards your dream life after the PhD. Great to see all of you and look forward to seeing you in the group and in our next videos.